Hi, and welcome to the Literature Lab, where you learn to read texts and write arguments like a literary critic. That means you read for details, quote texts with integrity, develop ideas into arguments, and use the right language. I'm Michael Elliott from the Department of English at the University of Calgary. Today's video is about how to pay attention to grammar so you look smart when you're making arguments. Have you ever met someone with flawless personal style, well-fitting clothes, good grooming, who has just one thing out of place? It might be spinach in their teeth or bad posture or body odor. It's just something you can't ignore that undermines their whole effect. You wish someone would tell them about it, but you don't want to embarrass them. Well then, allow me. Bad grammar is the body odor of language. You can write with elegant style and well-chosen words, but if you have a comma splice in the middle of your paragraph, it can really undermine your credibility. It's impossible to have perfect grammar, but if you address some common errors, you're a step closer to that. So here's a top 10 list of some common grammar mistakes. There are errors involving commas, semicolons, apostrophes, homonyms, inconsistent verbs, passive voice verbs, vague pronouns, misplaced modifiers, dangling modifiers, and parallelism. For each one, I'll start by defining it with examples and then I'll teach you how to prevent it. Let's begin. Before we address the first few problems, I need to explain the idea of clauses. A clause is a group of words containing a subject, a noun, and an action word, a verb. For instance, I listen or you teach. Each of these is an independent clause because each one makes sense by itself. The other kind of clause is a dependent clause, one whose meaning depends on another clause. Take the sentence, while you teach, I listen. The first clause depends on the second clause. Notice how clauses are usually, but not always, divided by commas. Good rule of thumb. A dependent clause like while you teach or while my guitar gently weeps is incomplete on its own. It needs another clause. Take another example. This literature lab video prevents crimes against grammar. That's an independent clause because it's a complete sentence. But we can make it dependent. Although this literature lab video prevents crimes against grammar, not every criminal will watch it. Their loss. You need the second clause to complete this thought. Okay then, let's turn to the first of our 10 most common grammar mistakes, errors involving commas. I mentioned the term comma splice earlier. What is that? Simply put, it's independent clauses, which are complete sentences, joined by a comma. Here's an example. This is actually two complete sentences, two independent clauses, spliced by a mere comma. So how do you use commas correctly? Two options. The first is not to use one, but to replace it with a period. If you have two sentences, let them be two sentences. Just don't forget to start the second with a capital letter. Your second option is to add something called a coordinating conjunction. These join independent clauses together. In the English language, there are seven coordinating conjunctions, and this acronym helps you remember them. Fanboys. For, and, nor, but, or, yet, so, let's try the first one on our fruity example. Other words can help you, including transitions. These are words or phrases that show how your thinking works. Examples include, in addition, for example, in fact, however, consequently, 
Similarly, therefore, then, and thus. Let's try therefore, which will take some rearrangement. Here we made it two sentences and added a comma in the second. There are other comma errors, but comma splices are pervasive. In general, remember, commas should only separate dependent clauses from independent ones, not two independent clauses, which are complete sentences. Many writers avoid using semicolons because they're scared of making mistakes, but don't be one of those people. In this section, you'll learn how useful and essential semicolons are. See how the semicolon looks like a period over a comma? That's because it's halfway between them, stronger than a comma, but weaker than a period. It's like the baby bear in Goldilocks, a pause that's not too short, not too long, but just right. There are two main scenarios for using a semicolon. The first is when separating multi-word items in a list. Consider this list. Oh, by the way, for any viewers outside of Canada, this is very true. Let's turn this list into a sentence. Because the list items are three or four words long, semicolons help to separate them, like the bullets did. You could use commas instead, but semicolons are stronger. The other scenario is one where you could use a period, but a semicolon is more appropriate. Remember independent clauses, which are complete sentences with a noun and a verb? If you have two that are closely linked, say in a comparison, use a semicolon, like this. It's even more common when the second sentence starts with a transition word or phrase, as in this example. Apostrophes are another oft-abused punctuation mark. Just remember three scenarios. If something belongs to a noun, use an apostrophe S, like this. But watch out for plural nouns ending in S, they take apostrophes after the S. Contractions are rare in academic writing, but you still need to understand them. Their apostrophes replace their missing letters, like this. Using apostrophes for plurals is a capital crime against grammar. It's right in the extremely rare instance of a single letter word. Some people then decided to use it everywhere. Don't be one of those people. A homonym is a fancy term for words that sound the same but mean different things, like I read the red book. They cause confusion when people use the wrong one. Here are five homonyms that you should use correctly. The first with the apostrophe is a contraction. Remember them? The apostrophe is replacing a letter in the phrase, it is, like this. But what about possessive apostrophes, you ask? I just told you to use one if something belongs to a noun, like this. But here's the problem. If we replace the monkey here with it, you need to drop the apostrophe or it'll become the contraction it is, which makes no sense here. So I, T, S, no apostrophe, is the exception to the possessive rule. The first shows that time has passed like this. The second shows a comparison. The first is the possessive form of you. The second is a contraction of you are. The first just means also. The second is the number two. The third is used in other circumstances to indicate motion in some direction or to identify a thing or person affected by something else. The first indicates someplace that's not here. 
The second is the possessive form of they. And the third is a contraction of they are. Most verb tenses refer to time, past or present or future. So, I understand is in the present tense, I understood in the past tense, and I will understand is future. The thing is, you need to choose one tense and stick with it. Inconsistencies can confuse your reader. They happen when you write about texts that were written in the past. The general rule is to describe things in texts in the present. For example, the character does this. But things in history in the past. For example, the author wrote that. But most often, just choose a tense and use it consistently for verbs with the same time frame. When you're rereading, make sure that any shift of tense is deliberate. Mistakes were made. This phrase about the Vietnam War is a famous denial of political responsibility, made worse by its grammatical crime. It uses a kind of verb called the passive voice, favored by politicians evading responsibility. So who made these mistakes? Be direct and switch to the active voice and then you have to say who. I made mistakes. Writers also use the passive voice when they want to evade responsibility, like for their interpretations. Here's an example. The first sentence is hesitating to make a claim directly in the active voice. The writer is unsure if they're right. They should either find more evidence or be confident about the evidence they have. A pronoun is a word that points to a noun, like he for Michael. Consider this sentence. Here, Michael is called the antecedent to the pronoun his. But if we have two antecedents, it's unclear which one his is pointing to. You could just rewrite the sentence to replace the pronoun with its antecedent, but this is repetitive. We use pronouns for a reason. Consider this sentence. Rewriting it to replace they with the cakes will work, but it feels repetitive. Another option is to replace they with a different noun that clearly refers to the cakes. A modifier is something that modifies or describes another word, like an adverb describing a verb or an adjective describing a noun. The placement of these words is important, as we can see when they're in the wrong place. Consider this sentence. Put the word only in different places in this sentence and it changes the sentence's meaning. This means it wasn't very significant that she said so. This means it was the only thing she told him. And this means she is the only one in the universe who feels this way. And so on. We could do this all day. The point is placement affects meaning. Two more examples. The first is of misplaced adjectives. This implies that the dog was studded. Place that adjective next to the word collar that it modifies. The last example is of misplaced phrases. Apparently my grandmother doesn't like doors. Move that phrase next to the word it modifies. Saw, not arrive. Sometimes, a modifier is not only misplaced, it's also unclear whether it modifies any word at all. Consider this example. This structure suggests a meaning that's clearly illogical. It's not the wave that's looking. 
Fixing dangling modifiers is more complex than moving them. You need to add something to the sentence. In this case, add a subject who's doing the looking and change the verb accordingly. Writers use parallel structures or verbal patterns to compare or list two or more ideas. They can be words, phrases, or clauses. Remember this example? Notice how each item in the list follows the same pattern. A verb, ending in ing, a pronoun, and a plural noun. Now, try to find what's wrong with this sentence. The third part, to dance, should end in ing to follow the same pattern. It's the same rule when each part is longer. Make the verb in the third part take the same form, to dance, as the others. The best way to catch these errors is to read your sentences aloud. If the words and or or are joining parts of your sentence, Check that the parts are parallel. Thanks for watching this video from the Literature Lab about avoiding common errors of grammar. Now go forth and look smart. And don't judge too harshly those who make mistakes. Pity them and then overpower them with your well-groomed grammatical superiority.